Alliance on the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair moves for approval of the agenda. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Announcements, October 18th, Facilities Committee meeting uh, right here at 7 a.m. November 7th, general and special election, um, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, November 10th, quarterly teaching and learning meeting, 7.30, right here in conference room A. And uh, November 13th, policy committee meeting, uh, 5.30, followed by the uh, regular school board meeting at 6 o'clock. Um, the chair moves for the appointment of uh, Natalie Miner as a student representative to the school board for the 23-24 school year. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'd now like to invite uh, Mark Fenright up to introduce the uh, Sheriff's success. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on up. Come on up. It's my pleasure tonight uh, to introduce to you three of our moms I'm here tonight to share a little bit about a middle school robotics camp that they put together this summer. And I just want to tell you just a really quick story. Um, Ron and Nora contacted me in June. They said, hey, we got this idea. We want to run a middle school camp. And immediately, being a former middle school teacher, I thought, ooh, I don't know if they know what they're getting into. And we had lots of talk about how we're going to do this and what it's going to look like. And they just pulled off this wonderful program. So I'm going to turn it over to them, and they're going to share with you what they did and how it went, and share some pictures. And I'm glad you came. So uh, we are some, not all of the Tarned Bots captains, and we all, like we started as like a team of individuals who are interested in uh, the STEM field, and just people who love the challenge, and people who love mechanics of everything. Yeah, so, uh, so on our robotics team, Tarned Bots, uh, at the end of each season, it's a seven seven week just building process, testing, designing, programming, all that stuff. It's very intensive. At the very end, we go to a competition up in Duluth with uh, many schools, it's, or with many teams from all around the world. Um, and we usually never place that high, but we have improved over the years, obviously, um, just as we've refined our process of you know building, testing, designing, and all that stuff. Uh, and so it's a student-led program mainly. Uh, of course, Mr. Kimball is there to supervise at all times and help as necessary, but it's mainly student-led. And um, yeah, it's just we, uh, we teach CAD, uh, CAD computer aided design, coding, and all the other stuff that are used to make a robot run properly. So essentially, the camp emulated our process uh, as high school members on a much smaller scale, on a more uh, controlled, less, you know, there's less pressure and uh, that kind of thing. What is the competition each year do? Is there a set time that that is? Uh, no. Yes, it's the first, it's like February 28th okay. to March 3rd. So it sort of kicks off right after the new year then? Yeah, so the, the kickoff together. is January 7th. Okay. And yeah. so we have about two and a half, three months to yeah, get roughly. everything yeah. done. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll switch back <laughs> into it. So um, basically, yeah, like Mr. Femright mentioned, uh, Nora and I had this idea sort of earlier along in the summer. We were like, okay, we want to, you know, somehow raise money for our team. We also want to spread robotics to the community because it was mainly strictly in the high school. So um, after planning out the details, figuring out the financials, figuring out how much things would cost, pricing, all that stuff, uh, we went to the community ed and they um, helped facilitate, you know, the advertising and all that stuff. And um, we also decided that uh, all the team's captains and uh, very dedicated members um, should be involved. So we have a pretty big high school team, but we wanted to choose, um, obviously, like I said, the captains and the more uh, the most dedicated students to help uh, to help run the camp. And so, like I said, the camp is just essentially a smaller scale version of our high school robotics team, um, and just you know, 
the time, the amount of pressure, but also uh, it introduced the students, um, you know, coding not just on a very you know block programming level, but like true like t typing based programming, um, CAD computer design, um, and 3D printing too. They created 3D printed stuff. You'll see the images here in a second, but um, yeah. So we also made an obstacle course that they had to compete on. So they had these little robots, we call them the Romy robots. And they have like all the code, the cat, and like the catting and all that. They catted their own parts to attach onto their robots. And uh, uh, every one of them was different. And so they had a set amount of challenges that they needed to complete, as well as how they could get points. And um, the bottom picture is a group all together coding, and the top picture is them actually putting their robots together. So we don't have any specific images. Unfortunately, I, didn't, I wasn't able to get them in on time. Sorry about that, by the way. Um, but each of the robots came in a kit, so it wasn't completely from scratch. But um, it had all the you know the control boards, the the all the little microprocessors, all that stuff. So as they were putting it together, we did our best to try and explain what each component of the robot was doing, how it contributed to the robot moving around, and uh, I tried to keep it as like as high level as possible, so that they understood um, what each part of the robot, you know, what you know the coding does and all that stuff. We tried to keep it high level and not too in depth and too like complicated for them, uh, but enough so that they could, you know, use these skills later on in the future, um, like if they choose to join the high school robotics team or maybe. So um, here, or, oh, sorry. Let's get, sorry about that. So uh, on the photo on the right, they're coding. Uh, one of the groups is coding. And, um, you know, obviously we're there at all times making sure that they're not getting too confused, helping them out when necessary. Um, bottom photo there, that's Ben. He is putting on his uh, 3D. That's a sensor, I think, and he's putting on a sensor called an ultrasonic sensor that detects uh, distance between objects and stuff. So that um, you know, it's, it's pretty cool, and they thought it was pretty cool too. Uh, and then in the top left there, that's uh, one of our team members on the, the right of that photo, uh, Sam Fleener. He said he'd be here, and he is there. Uh -huh. it looks like it looks like the best. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, there's two of them actually. Yeah, we yeah, just went right into oh, yeah. on the right in the blue shirt. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Fleener, do you have anything? No, no. Nope. It was a great experience. It was a great experience yeah. for both them and uh, and for us. So, yeah. So, do you guys have any questions? How many? How many yeah, how many students? How many students did you get up with? Um, 18. 18. 18. Wow, great start. Awesome. Yeah. Do you think you'll keep doing it? Or do yes. It? Yeah. Sure. yeah. So, our expenses this year were a lot, obviously, since we had to buy all the robots and stuff. But now that we have them, uh, next year, if we get the same expected turnout or expenses should be much, much less than they were. So you can reuse the robots? Would it, yes. Would yes. it be the same, would they be catting the same like obstacle course then with new kids? Or we will so probably like, have a different obstacle course. I was saying, because you have some kids coming yeah, back. Right? Right. We'll yeah. try to refine it, you know, with this, yeah. these next few months that we have to make it, uh, it was, we tried our best to stay organized through the camp, but obviously they're middle schoolers, right? They're gonna wanna run around and do stuff. So our goal for the next 10 months or so is to really figure out how we can keep our uh, camp more organized and more uh, keep our process more refined and uh, just you know overall make yeah. it a better experience. Yeah. Make wow. it better this year. Yeah. Are you guys getting what you need for resource wise or is it something where you guys got to do your own fundraising or is it is this is this stuff all supplied but school are you getting what you need to be successful that's that's one of the yeah questions. I mean we did have to do some of our own funding we got refunded or okay. like because I had bought some things that we had needed. Um, but other than that, like we had gotten most of the, the stuff that we needed for this. And also this is one of our fundraisers. So we can use the money that we got from this and the stuff that we get next year, which should be about double what we got this year. So was it a, was it a one week camp or how many days? Yes. Four days. Four days for four how many hours each day? day? Uh, three and a half hours to four I, hours. I like the day. one bullet point you had that said something about being able to, thought you'd be able to keep the kids busy for, or uh, <laughs> where was that one right there? The yeah. third one. Keep yeah. the kids entertained yeah. throughout the week. That's, yeah. that's impressive with. Yeah. 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 I want to compliment you of yeah. using an opportunity for kids to also be your fundraiser. I mean, yeah. that's, that is a, a brilliant approach where it's an opportunity for them. It provides you a little bit of funding. 
Yeah. Now with your high school robotics program, this last year was one of your largest as far as enrollment. Yeah. You yeah. had about 30? 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 to 40. Oh, it's fantastic. And that, and that will continue to grow. Definitely. We have now a middle school first robotics team. So there's 20 middle schoolers right now that are meeting every Wednesday. That's going to feed into... Weren't they doing something with Legos or something? Yeah, Legos. Yeah. So first robotic Legos. Yeah. So they built smaller robots. I'm wondering if community can get shit off of this for like old retired guys. Who yeah, are there you go. Seriously. I mean, I don't know what... Wow. You say catting, I'm going, what's that? Yeah, I should learn that. Yeah. yeah. You still have a flip phone, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Not that bad. I got a dial phone at home. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want... It's really amazing. Yeah. I'm curious... Uh, for most of these kids, was this their absolute first exposure oh, to that kind of coding? Yes. Had they done any of that it's actually? Before? Like there was one. There was one, there was one who yeah. knew like a lot of it, okay. and then there was all the rest of them were confused, confused. when we first started. Yeah. yeah. We were lucky to have people like Rohan who knew the coding on a much more in-depth level, so that the rest of us could help out the kids who it was their first experience, and Rohan could help the people who already had that experience with coding. So we weren't just saying, oh, you already know it. You go do your own thing, right? We were having everybody get engaged in that process. Mm -hmm. Very good. The last thing I would share, they did a really, really nice job building relationships with these middle mm -hmm. schoolers. These young, young students interacting with these upperclassmen. It just sets them up with a great experience when they get to be a high schooler. I mean, just, it, yes. it was just, it's just awesome. Echo just the same thing. I hope you yeah. guys know how important you are because these kids looking up to you. And thank you, thank you for yeah. taking the time to do that sure. with the kids. It's, it's awesome. So kudos to you all. Yes. And finally, to build a program takes a lot of work. I mean, yeah. you're, you're literally building something at West Concord right now, and it's a program that we want uh, to flourish here. And so part of our long range plans is that there's a dedicated space uh, for, you don't have to take that down and putting it back together, but that you have storage and also equipment to be making or designing what you're hoping to do here. So I think you're showing us the importance of this type of programming. There's obviously a number of kids that are interested and if we give you a dedicated space for it, we believe it's only gonna grow. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that wish to address the board? None? Then we'll move on to the uh, reports. Our treasurer is only going to be here this evening, but provided a full report that uh, Lauren's going to fill us in on. So the donations for August 2023, the Hilltop families donated to Hilltop Primary School a total of $3,640. The Charities Aid Foundation donated to the Mount Westonic High School $87.32. Anonymous donation to Mount Westonic High School for $60. Um, anonymous donation to Community Ed Boys Volleyball for $200. Anonymous, date, anonymous donation to Community Ed West Honka Community Theater for $255. And another anonymous donation to Community Ed West Honka Community Theater for $238.86. The West Honka Lions donated to Community Ed West Honka Community Theater $5,000. The Dietrich family donated to Community Ed Music in the Park $200. Edward Jones donated to Community Ed Music in the Park $250. Patrick and Patricia Stroller donated to the Ann Nyman Memorial Scholarship $1,000. The Northwest Tonka Lions donated to the Northwest Tonka Lions Scholarship $6,000. Butch Humbert donated to Larry Axel Memorial Scholarship $100. The Lions Club donated to the Captain's Club $4,000. Brand royalties donated to the Captain's Club $4.43. And Claire Kaufman donated to the Captain's Club $20. The West Honka Girls Hockey Boosters donated to the West Honka Girls Hockey Club $1,660. 
Cairo Center donated to the Hockett Dance Team, $300. Grady Restoration donated to the Hockett Dance Team, $300. Gina Halverson donated to the Hockett Dance Team, $100. Decorating with Grace LLC donated to the Hockett Dance Team, $500. Steve Bedell donated the Hockett Stance Team $500. Surfside donated the Hockett Stance Team $300. Mom Back and Neck Clinic donated the Hockett Stance Team, team $150. The Cave West Tonka donated to the Hockett Stance Team $300. Hop Industries donated the Hockett Stance Team $100. Anonymous donation to the Hockett Stance Team $50. JDP Electrical to the Hockett Dance Team, $500. Jubilee Foods to the Hockett Dance Team, $100. Mount Family Hardware to the Hockett Dance Team, $100. Blue Lagoon Marina to the Hockett Dance Team, $100. Innovative Marine Systems to the Hockett Dance Team, $500. And Fairway Mortgage to the Hockett Dance Team, $500. Special Olympics Minnesota donated to the West Tonka Girls Soccer $630 and the West Tonka Volleyball Boosters donated to the Volleyball Club $1,545. The total cash donations uh, for year to date 2024 at this time are $47,245.43. Thank you, Laura. Um, next, we'll move on to the student rep uh, report, Natalie. And uh, not only did you get approved tonight, you get to come up and talk to us. So you go. Uh, thank you. All right, I'm super excited to give you an update on um, activities, arts, and academics at our school. Um, starting off with activities, we had our homecoming week last week. We started off with our coronation, where Maisie Wheeler and Henry Meisel are queen and king. Um, we had our pep fest last week at the middle and high school, and they were super successful. We had some new activities that we did. Our dress up days were really popular with students, and we also had really great dance attendance with um, a lot of increase in school spirit. We had over 390 students attend the dance, and we had a record-breaking carnival before the game on Friday with um, great participation and fundraising, and um, we had a different parade group this year, but it was very successful. Um, Student Sec Senate is conducting elections for eighth graders this week um, until next week. Um, moving on to clubs, DECA officers held an interest meeting for new members on September 27th, and then they have their first chapter meeting on October 4th. The robotics team is hosting an informational meeting tomorrow from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Um, Letters of Love and L Fellowship of Christian Athletes are having their first meetings on Wednesday, October 5th. The Environmental Club has its first meeting um, on Monday, October 9th. And National Honor Society had their first meeting on September 13th, and we'll have a meeting next week. Um, moving on to arts, Mad Jazz editions were held last month and they began rehearsals on September 19th. They just had their first public performance at the alumni breakfast last week. Um, Peter and the Starcatcher edition, the first week of school, and they have been in rehearsals ever since. The show is coming up next weekend, October 13th to 15th, and is directed by Joe Lawrence and assisted by Jamie Harms. The show has 21 students on stage and five on the crew. Moving on to academics, 41 Mount Westonka students just earned AP Scholar Awards this year, and two seniors were just named National Merit semifinalists. Um, moving on to athletics, the varsity football team has a 4-1 record after a really tough loss against Orono on Friday and Saturday for homecoming. <laughs> They've had a great season so far with a great comeback to Providence last Friday and they're currently ranked number five in class 4A for state. Um, the varsity volleyball team has a current record of 13 and two. They are traveling to Orono tomorrow, and then they have a home game against Southwest Christian this Thursday. The varsity boys soccer team is having a great season. They have two home games this week against Watertown Mayor right now, and um, Southwest Christian on Thursday. Um, the girls swim and dive team is currently ranked fifth in the state for division A. 
they had a home meet against Watertown last Thursday. The girls tennis team just won 7-0 against their third team in a row and they start their first round of sections tomorrow. All six cross country teams are very successful with the girls varsity being exceptionally su successful and they compete at Collinwood Park last Tuesday. Um, lastly, the girls soccer team is entering their final week of the regular season with two games tonight and Thursday. Natalie's yeah. pretty humble, but she's one of those national merit um, <laughs> semifinals. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. So, okay, so who's the other one, just so we know? Cormac Schaefer. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak. And, yeah, yeah. No problem. And as we normally, if, if you've got places to go and things to do, feel free to leave or we can stay for yeah. the meeting. Or I have a soccer game. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you have something to do. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Are there any committee reports? Um, I'm trying to remember who's, who's on the committee. You want to community at with Yes. Are, yep. are you going to be there tomorrow? Yeah, 4 30. Yeah? Yep. Okay, all right. Yeah. Are you going to be there? I'll, I'll be there for about half of it. I'm okay. on grandparent duty to bring the kids to practice okay. tomorrow. So, yeah, I'll be there. All yeah. right. Sounds good. Thanks, Lori. Um, financial report. Kathy? Good evening, board. Um, we have a, a guest speaker tonight, but before I introduce um, Aaron, I'll give a quick financial report. Um, the first thing I'll uh, share with you is our October 1st enrollment. Um, so we have the first month of the school year closed out already, and this information displays, um, again, our October 1st count. Uh, the first cluster of charts on the far left-hand side are, the, are representing the primary school grades, uh, early childhood through grade four, uh, the next um, to the right are middle school grades five through six, five, excuse me, five through seven, and then our high school grades eight through 12. And the far right hand column is um, our total enrollment. The blue column represents our final enrollment as of last school year. The orange column represents what we planned on as far as our estimated enrollment for the budget. And then lastly, the gray column is um, our count as of today. And you can see in the orange bar, we actually were um, expecting um, a decline in enrollment. And the reason for that is last spring, we graduated one of our largest classes and we had planned on um, 170 kindergartners. And I'm happy to report that um, as of today, our enrollment actually is very similar to last year. And in fact, um, when we uh, process the revised budget, if things stand as they are, uh, we'll be including 25 um, additional students than in our adopted budget. So again, we're really pleased with our start of the school year and our stable enrollment. That's awesome. Um, financial da data, um, revenues and expenditures through the end of September, um, we have received 3163000 or 8.5% of our adopted budget and expenditures are um, at 7,283,000 or 20.4% of our budget. Um, both the revenue and expenditures are trending on track as compared to the two prior school years. Uh, just a couple other items. Um, last month you at the board meeting uh, approved our levy at maximum. That information needed to be submitted to Hennepin County and the Department of Education by September 30th, which we did. Um, they'll be processing the tax statements that um, property tax owners will receive, and we will be having our truth and taxation hearing um, at the beginning of our December 4th regular school board meeting. Um, later on your agenda, um, after the audit's approved, you'll be, um, there'll be an action item to approve the audit, and school districts are required to publish our budget in the newspaper one week following the acceptance of the final audit, and our report will be displayed in Saturday's edition of the Lakers, so you can look forward to seeing that. And um, I'll open it up to any questions um, at this time. And if there aren't, um, um, I'll take this time now to introduce Aaron Dahl of Bergen KDV. Um, he will be presenting uh, a summary of the fiscal year 22-23 audit. And on behalf of the West Tonka School District, I'd like to personally thank Aaron for being here tonight and also to him and his team for their professional manner in conducting the audit and their customer service. Uh, Bergen KDB, um, they share our same goal of, um, and values of being 
good stewards of public dollars and transparent reporting. for the opportunity to be your auditors again this year, and thanks for the opportunity to present here tonight. Um, I'll kind of walk through a few of the different reports that uh, we issued our opinions on, and then kind of walk through some of the trends and uh, interesting financial data that we discovered this year. So starting with the audit results. So the first one, the independent auditors report, that's kind of why we're hired as auditors to give an opinion on your financial statements, and we're happy to report. we did issue an unmodified opinion, which is the best opinion we can give as auditors. So uh, a great job by Kathy and Pat and the rest of the finance team on uh, achieving that unmodified opinion again this year. Uh, we also performed a single audit in accordance with uniform guidance. So um, the way that works is a single audit is required when a district has 750,000 um, in federal expenditures or more. So. Uh, we looked at one program this year, which was the special education cluster, um, and happy to report uh, we had an unmodified opinion on that program as well with no findings. Uh, the next one is the government auditing standards report. Uh, we did have one finding there, um, which is one we've shown in the past as well, the lack of segregation of accounting duties, um, and we do have it at the lower level. So not of major concern, but it is something we do kind of point out uh, to the board uh, each year. Um, and it's basically based on the overlap of duties and the opportunity does exist based on the access and ability for someone to have more than one role um, within that financial reporting system. Um, I do want to point out though the district does have good mitigating controls in place with the checks and balances and reconciliations performed. So it's not, again, a huge concern of ours, but it is something we do point out. Um, and along with that, the cost benefit of Hiring the additional staff to kind of get rid of that comment probably isn't practical or something that um, is worth pursuing. We basically have that comment in one way, shape, or form for almost all of the districts we do audit. And then lastly, the Minnesota Legal Compliance Report. So that's where we look at things like collateral, bids, conflicts of interest, things of that nature. Um, and again, happy to report no findings on the compliance side. Next, I'll get into some of the communication letter items and trends and topics. So uh, the first chart here we have is the general education aid formula allowance. Uh, the largest single funding source for Minnesota school districts is the basic general education aid. Uh, each year, the state legislature sets a basic formula allowance, which is shown here with the dollar amounts and the percentage increases. Um, the total basic general education revenue is calculated by multiplying this formula allowance by the number of pupil units for which a district is entitled to. So uh, this formula allowance along with uh, the number of students within the district uh, plays a big part in the amount of state aid that the district receives. Uh, as you can see from fiscal year 23, you saw a 2% increase in that general education aid formula allowance. Um, it had been 2.5% the previous year but dropped back down to the kind of standard 2% uh, for fiscal year 23. Uh, for fiscal year 24, you will see there is a 4% increase, so a nice jump there um, on the state aid side uh, that you should be able to see in the upcoming year. Next, we have the student count. So taking a look at the resident ADM and the ADM served. Um, <clears throat> the total ADM served does include residents attending the district, uh, non-resident enrollment option students, and then resident tuition students. So that's why you see a bit of a difference there between the total resident ADM and the total ADM served. Um, as the charts indicate, the resident ADM did increase by 4 or 0.1%, uh, while the total ADM served decreased by 6 or 0.3%. So um, pretty stable ADM student counts throughout the five years, which is pretty commendable, especially throwing in kind of the COVID years mixed in there. Um, a lot of districts had students leave the district with homeschooling or uh, transferring out um, to other uh, districts. So uh, commendable on that front and good to see that stabilization. Here it is in graphical form. So again, you can see pretty much straight across the board, uh, the total resident ADM around that 2700 number and the total ADM served around the 2400 number. 
years. So uh, over the five year period, you'll see a bit of an increase uh, from 26.89 up to 26.97. And then on the total side, the 23.62 up to the 24.12. Next, we'll dig into the general fund and we'll start with the sources of revenue here. Um, overall, the district's general fund revenues increased by about 40,000 or 0.1%, so pretty similar to the prior year. Uh, the state revenues did increase by about 198,000 uh, with that increase in general, general education aid along with an increase in special education aid. The local property tax revenue increased by about 326,000 for the year with an increase in the levy allocation for the general fund. And then the other revenue category decreased by 484,000. So that's the category where you'll see a lot of the federal aid. So a lot of that was a bit inflated in the past uh, couple of years with um, a lot of those CARES funding and some of those uh, COVID related grants. Next, we just have kind of a pie graph here showing the revenue classification um, and the affiliated percentages. So as you can see, the state revenue stood at 62% and uh, served the majority of the revenues. Local property taxes around 30% and then that other revenue category at 8%. Uh, those 2023 numbers are relatively similar to the prior years, so pretty, pretty stagnant on the percentage based um, as well. Taking a look at the budget to actual results for the general fund, uh, on the revenue side that came in about 740000 over the final amended budget. The largest variance uh, by category was from the revenue from the federal sources due to an additional COVID testing grant that was not originally budgeted. The other local revenues were over budget by about 256,000 with more investment earnings than budgeted. So a good conservative approach there. And then the other revenue categories were relatively consistent with their budgeted amount. So uh, you'll see a bit of, a little bit of a change with the taxes and state sources, but those were pretty much spot on when it came to the revenue side. <clears throat> Taking a look at the general fund expenditures, those exceeded the final amended budget by about 34,000. So again, pretty much spot on with what was anticipated. Taking a look at individual categories, the regular instruction was about 206,000 under budget due to, due to there being less registration fees and contract and maintenance than planned. District support surface services came in about 194,000 under budget with fewer salary and benefit expenses with some open positions during the year. And then these were partially offset by an overage and pupil support services by about 345,000 and then sites and buildings by about 264,000. And both of those looked like they were uh, the result of having more capital related expenditures and repair projects than initially anticipated. From the general fund operational side, we have the previous five years presented. Uh, the revenues again increased by 0.1% with the expenditures increasing by 5.5%. And a lot of that had to do kind of with the inflationary costs um, for fiscal year 23. Uh, the general fund did experience an overall increase in fund balance by about 56,000. So kind of that third line item down. Um, at the end of the fiscal year, the general fund had a fund balance of about 6.2 million the bottom line there. Of this amount, about 50,000 represents non-spendable balances, which relates to inventory and prepaid items. Um, the restricted fund balance for operating capital totaled about 478,000. And then student activities was around 483,000 for restricted purposes. Um, and then the remaining unassigned fund balance of about 3.2 million. So um, as you can see, that increased by about 45,000 compared uh, to fiscal year 22. So a bit of an increase there as well for the general fund. Next, we have the financial position and the cash and investments for the general fund for the past five years. So um, as you can see, the cash and investments have increased again for fiscal year 23. That's one of those that can kind of fluctuate based on operations and the ins and outs around year end. So, uh, not a surprise there. Uh, the bottom line is the unassigned fund balance, which increased slightly as well, um, as I previously touched on, but for the most part has seen kind of a steady growth there. So not a lot of peaks and valleys when it comes to the unassigned fund balance. So um, good to see that stability there. Next, we have the unrestricted fund balance as a percent of the general fund expenditures. Uh, 
both for the West Tonka School District and then uh, the school districts across the state as well in blue there. So historically, uh, the district has been lower than the average of all Minnesota school districts, um, but did see an increase uh, for fiscal year, or I'm sorry, saw a slight decrease for fiscal year 23. Um, it dropped from 18.5% down to 17%. Uh, the fund balance policy for the district calls for a minimum of 8% and a maximum of 18%. So right in line uh, with where uh, things are planned to be. So. Next I'll touch on the special revenue funds and starting with the food service fund here for the previous five years. Um, for the fiscal year 23, the food service revenues did decrease by 29.1%, uh, while expenditures decreased by 0.6%. Uh, the revenues did decrease as a result of less federal aid, um, while the expenditures remained relatively consistent. So uh, fiscal year 22, you saw a lot of reimbursement for pretty much all of the meals uh, that the district had, and that um, kind of discontinued a little bit for fiscal year 23. So that's kind of why you saw the drop there. Even with that, the revenues did exceed expenditures by about $7,800 uh, for the year, uh, with an addition of $10,000 from other financing sources as well. The fund balance uh, ended at a little over $1.1 million at the end of the year. So uh, again, good to see those positive operations for the food service fund. That's not always easy to do um, across the state to kind of have that self-supporting um, excess of revenues over expenditures. And lastly, we have the Community Service Fund. Uh, revenues here increased by about 406000 for the year, uh, due in large part to the increased levy allocation for this fund, along with higher participation in programming and higher memberships for the West Tonka Activity Center in 2023. Expenditures did increase as well by 347000 uh, due to more expenditures for contracted services uh, to help with that increased participation throughout the programming. So, um, the result was an increase in fund balance of 135000 uh, for fiscal year 23. So again, good to see the community service fund rebound uh, again in 2023. As you can kind of see in 2020 and 2021, uh, it was kind of rough with all the COVID impact. Uh, some of those other financing sources were transfers from the general fund to kind of help uh, stabilize the community service fund. But it's good to see it's back on track and producing positive results in fiscal year 23. Lastly, we just have the overall net position of the district. So this includes all long-term assets and long-term liabilities of the district as well. Um, based on the bottom line, you can see the total net position did increase from a little over 15 million to over 23 million at the end of the year. Um, but a lot of times these numbers can fluctuate a lot with the pension amounts, um, some of the OPEB benefits that are played into that as well. So. Um, I always like to point out the net pension liability did increase by about 12 million for the year, um, but that's not something the district will ever have to write a check for. It's just something uh, the state keeps track of and they seem to change the discount rates on that net pension liability quite often. So uh, not of major importance, it's more the fund level I'd be concerned with um, on the district level, but we do have the total net position here as well. All right, with that, I'll open it up to any questions or comments the board may have? I have one on the general fund um, balance, you know, we have that we want to keep between 8 and 18 percent. I noticed that all, like, they were all up in the 20s. 23, are we not where we should be, or is our goal? It's based on what the district is comfortable okay. with. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of like the out state schools <laughs> aren't as concerned with that. And it's not always okay. great to have a lot of extra funds sitting there too. That means right. it's not, you're not spending it on your teachers or capital projects that might be needed. So okay. um, it is still a healthy fund balance. And like I said, it's based on what the district kind of strives to achieve and you're well within that okay. range. One, you know, one thing we've done, Kelly, is put some of those monies into restricted or designated. So like we have more funds, we put some more funds like into class size reduction. So that if we need to, class gets too big, we need to hire an extra teacher, we've got that funding. Um, you know, we could put more into the unrestricted, but right. we, we right. want to designate yep. some of that up there, yeah. Right, yeah, and you do have a lot in those assigned sections as well. So assigned education, class size reduction, technology repairs and then the West Tonka Wings program. So you're already setting some of that aside yeah. for 
good purposes that um, well, help, help the district. One time. question I had there, it looks like student activities got moved up under staff development, is that? Yeah, that was kind of a change um, on the uh, Minnesota side. So it okay. used to have separate reporting, separate um, everything. It used to kind of be not, and now it's part of the general one. So okay. it's um, under board control, whereas before it was not it was board Before control. it was a separate account yep. then? That was okay. something that so occurred through all Minnesota. Yep, not just this. Okay. Looks like you're good. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Just give me a minute here and I'll get this up. I have just a brief report for you. All right, uh, tonight, just Two brief updates uh, for you. At, at your table is a handout that is from the Minnesota School, I uh, think, Second Year Principals Association. And it's a summary of all the mandates that came through from the 2023 Minnesota Legislature. And it is something that we will be unpacking for the, not just this year, but multiple years. And it's a lot of wonderful things in there. And I just listed all the different categories that is a part of this very comprehensive legislation. I would suggest that if you needed a quick cheat sheet as to what's going on with those mandates, this is a great guide. It, it is a very nice summary. I mean, the Minnesota School Board Association has theirs, the Department of Ed has theirs. I just find this one very succinct. And, and just a plug for our quarterly teaching and learning meeting in November, we'll go into more detail uh, about what's in there at that meeting. But what I want to just pull out for you tonight are just a couple things that are very relevant to our students and what I focus on. And there are new graduation requirements uh, that are coming through that is starting for our current eighth graders at our high school that the the current eighth grader and younger now will have a required earth science credit. So right now in eighth grade, um, we are offering probably about 13 sections of physical science because it's this group of students that took earth science for the first time in sixth grade. They took their middle school life science and now they're taking their physical science in eighth grade. That's a change. That'll be the first group that'll take a high school earth science course the next year. And that's across the state of Minnesota. That, that's a new requirement. And then another requirement that came through with, with, the, with the legislation is a required government and citizens course. Now we offer 12th grade civics, and I'm gonna say tonight that's gonna cover that requirement, but we'll learn more in the coming months from the Department of Ed as exactly what they're looking for. Definitely the new course uh, requirement for graduation will be a personal finance course. And a lot of people have been waiting for that. And we don't have the parameters yet and the details of what needs to be offered, but think about a semester course that you'll have to complete on personal finance by the time you graduate. Now we'll have to do some work about how we fit that into the schedule and how that looks for students, but that'll be something that probably will come to the board for approval um, when it's the right time to, to do that work. So a question between, so the first one it says required earth science, the legs to our offer government, offer personal finance, does that yeah. mean the students, you, you, I'm mixing yeah. up requirement yeah. Yeah, yeah. and offer? Yeah. Yeah. Good, catch, good catch, I just grabbed the language out of the this document here, right. I can replace offer with required. So a, a student has, required. sometime in high school, a student yes. has to take a personal finance course. Yes. Okay, yes. see, I was looking yeah. at offer Thank you going, for, thank for clarifying yeah. that. You may make an offer to me, I may not want right. it. No, okay. it's required. Yeah. Okay. We will decide and figure out how to fit it in, yeah. and where that happens, and, uh, but. But then like the government one, you're saying you already have a civics I course agree. that you think would qualify. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bank on that, but yeah. we'll, we'll get more clarification. 
coming up. The personal finance uh, course and yeah. stuff like that, is that something we would tie in with our, our teaching staff that we have, or would we draw in outside sources um, with banks coming in and talking and, and working? We, and we would first start with our current teaching staff okay. for that. Now, it would be great to have some real-life applications to bring financial uh, people in or bankers in to really give a real understanding of what, what happens, but that will be a course, as I think what you're thinking about, your personal finances, oh, credit cards, savings, mortgages, checking accounts, um, time to, yeah. to have that. The, the other thing I just wanted to mention um, to you tonight is that you'll hear a lot about the REED Act, and that, it, it's really a big deal, it, it, um, and it's the Minnesota Reading to Ensure Academic Development Act, and it, it's a big deal because it's really zeroing in on ensuring all students can read at grade level by the time they graduate. And we talk a lot about all students can read by the time they reach grade three. This goes deeper into making sure beyond grade three, we're doing everything we can to make sure kids are reading at, at the proper level. The good news is everything you're going to hear about in these requirements, we're already doing. We're in great shape with this. So for example, um, one thing that we will formalize more is required training of all teachers and instructional support staff around reading instruction. So you look at those areas, phonemic awareness, phonics, reading fluency, comprehension, culturally responsive instruction, we do that already. The shift for us is gonna be not only um, our teachers that teach reading, like our elementary staff, our special education staff, but we'll be bringing in, let's say at the middle school, high school, our social studies teachers, our science teachers, our elective teachers, and we have a timeline of when we need to finish this. And the state is approving uh, very specific uh, trainings to use with our staff. And I would be the first one to tell you there's a whole lot of detail to figure out as to how and when we're going to do this training. But we also have, um, right here in the West Metro, a great group of curriculum leaders, directors, administrators, and we're meeting on Friday, and then we're going to be talking about this. Like, how are we going to do this? What does that look like? How do you interpret the statute? So more to come on that, but we're already doing this. Um, it's a matter of figuring out how we do it beyond just our teachers that teach reading. So that's one piece. The other piece that comes as part of the requirements is uh, required literacy screeners. Again, we already do that. We have our fast bridge assessment system. We screen our kids in math and reading in the fall and the spring, and that's what they're requiring. We do that in grades K through eight. And then beyond grade eight would be kids that are like in our access intervention program. So the screener is very important because that is where we have the first understanding of which kids are above grade level, which kids are not. And then we get into our whole discussion about multi-tier systems of support and what we're going to do about that. So Fast Bridge, the second diamond there, is, um, is an approved system by the Department of Ed for literacy screening. So that's a shift. That's, the Department of Ed is coming through. They're saying, this is the type of training you need to do. These are the approved methods. These are the approved uh, screener assessment tools. FastBridge is one of them, and we've been using FastBridge for about seven years. And then the last arrow, we're required to implement progress monitoring. So progress monitoring is where we've identified students that are, are reading below grade level. We're delivering interventions to them. We progress monitor, so every two weeks, we would give them a very specific, short little, call it a subtest on a specific concept to see if they're making progress. That's all part of the multi-tier systems of support. Again, that becomes a requirement for all school systems across Minnesota who already are doing those things. So uh, these are just examples of, of this READ Act. Uh, the last couple of things I'll just share with you we can't just pick any reading program just because it feels good. It needs to be evidence-based. So we've 
uh, right now at the elementary level, we've just adopted the Wonders uh, reading program. That is an evidence-based literacy curriculum. We're in great shape with that. And then the last piece, which is really, it's really interesting what they're requiring of, of school systems. We have to employ a literacy lead. Someone in the district that is identified as the person that's going to lead the implementation of the Read Act. Well, we've had Natalie Bulo as our elementary academic literacy specialist for about 10 years. And she does a marvelous job um, with our, our elementary buildings. And this year, we just hired Robert Bevers, and he's our full-time reading specialist at the high school. And I tell you, it is a pleasure having this, this gentleman work at our high school. I, we, we figured out how to support that staff, that staffing, and he is already just going great guns, supporting the staff, giving training to our staff about reading strategies in the classroom. He's setting up um, intervention groups with kids that are reading below grade level. And right now, we're gonna use those two individuals as our literacy lead uh, to help support this Read Act. So that's just a little taste of what's in that document. There's a lot more to unpack. But my message to you tonight is that we're in great shape. We have work to do, don't get me wrong, we have work to do, we have things to figure out, but we're in a strong position uh, with this work and with these requirements. So the last thing I just wanted to share with you, as we talked last year, we are in our second year of implementing the multi-tier systems of support. It's around social, emotional health, academics, behavioral health, and attendance. And for the 23-24 school year, we have six specific goals that we're focusing on to take the next steps. And what I would just summarize for you is that we simply want to go deeper into delivering Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 interventions uh, for our students in the area of social emotional health, behavior, and academics. And the one goal that I would highlight tonight is number two. Everything starts in the classroom. Everything starts with tier one intervention instruction in the classroom. And on our workshop day on October 18, we're gonna be doing some training on tier one intervention instruction with our Park at the Carey Center for the U of M. They're coming in, they'll be working with our elementary staff that day and our high school staff on tier one intervention and instruction. Like what does it mean? Not so much in the area of academics, but what should we be doing in the area of social emotional health and behavior health uh, in our classrooms? So I'll continue to come to these meetings and give you updates. At our quarterly TNL meeting, I'll go more in depth with these, these things. But again, my message is that we are in a strong position with these, these fronts, and it's a really good work that is happening. So that's my report. I get dizzy just listening to you talk about all of these things, and I'm so thankful for you and Kevin and the principals that keep all yeah. this in motion. Thank you. It's like uh, they've never caught up. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's constant changes and new directives. And Kevin, you're on. Well, as Natalie said, we just completed homecoming week. And um, it was really fantastic. I, but I, I want to start by uh, just saying that it's, it's been such a positive start to the school year. And you get into homecoming week, and it's this recognized week where you really try to make this a special, fun event for your students. It's a time to bring in community and alumni. And it's, um, it's really part of strengthening what it is to be a West Honka student, what it is to be a White Hawk. You're welcoming your Mohawks, you're welcoming your people that look at the district as mound, and you bring yourself all together, and it um, makes you feel really, really proud that you were able to raise your kids in this community. Uh, as Natalie said, the week really kicks off on the Sunday before with coordination, and then in all the buildings, there's different events. So one of the things is dress-up days. 
and to give you a little texture of dress up days, some of it is fun where I'm like, that doesn't seem that long ago, but it's Adam Sandler day. And I'm like, I, I can do that pretty well. That doesn't need a dress up day. I can probably do the Sandler day. It's everything but a backpack day where kids challenge themselves of how they can carry their stuff in anything but a backpack. So some of them are coming around with crock pots or some, I mean, the most bizarre thing that they can put their stuff in. And so it's just, it's good humor. And you also have some things that are so touching, which is uh, we have students that dress up as your favorite teacher, your favorite staff member. And just in our last uh, newsletter, we have a Hilltop student uh, dressing up as Mr. Troy and it just shows you everywhere, anywhere, there are relationships that are impactful and being made, and that's what I think of West Tonka. And so it's a time for us to celebrate some of those connections. We have a lot of sporting events and activities that have their own traditions, but with all these home games, we had a back-to-back -back soccer like you're seeing again today, but in the middle of it, all of our parents, I think Colin Mather might have started this, where there was a chili cook-off, you have 21, I believe, crock pots of different chili that they're competing between the boys and the girls. And it's just a way of bringing families together in connection and it just feels so good. And so you get these different experiences going through the, the week and then you start bringing up to, as uh, you heard, the parade route had to change and we had some road construction and our students did a great job with that effort staff did. Uh, we had our alumni breakfast, which is always so much fun uh, because you have some people that you've never met before and some people will never miss one of these alumni breakfasts and both are fantastic when they're coming in and you get to be able to connect with them. Uh, we, we get into the football game and you know that, that is something that I was so excited for but really tired about because we knew with great opportunity comes great responsibility. And we knew that night we were gonna have the largest attendance is what we projected at ever at Hadorf Field. Um, we, knew, we knew that there'd be a lot of excitement. We had rivalry between Orono and Mount. We had two four and old football team. We had what appeared at the time to be really good weather. And in that, we wanted this to be a time that just went perfect. Weeks before that, we took time to meet as a staff of how are we gonna manage the crowd? Uh, how can we make sure that they're gonna stay safe? We had pre-meetings with our law enforcement of how we could handle different circumstances. And I really hope to our community that was invisible, but on the back end of it, there is just hours and hours and hours of planning of how you're gonna manage uh, these things and with it uh, it was tested we ran in like a lot of communities some weather that was the one thing that we thought we were kind of safe from when we we're looking at the weather and then I talked to the National Weather Service at about noon one o'clock looks like it's going north Kevin and um, also <laughs> might get a little bit of rain so you go into the excitement and you're at the first quarter and you got this drive that the boys take down and we get the first touchdown in and then all of a sudden they're coming back and you got 13-7 uh, at the end of first quarter and this is how West Tonka works. We have people that are watching the weather and I'm standing there and the parent says, Kevin, you're watching the weather. I said, yeah, we got watching weather. They said, Hutchinson, yeah, 60 mile an hour winds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, we worked the script and Todd said, okay, everyone pay attention. You're going to be making an exit. What Todd didn't know is right at that moment, uh, we made the decision. I made the decision that uh, we need to postpone this and how it works with the postponing or a canceling uh, one is determined by lightning, but there's also just the concern about inclement weather. And the one thing that we didn't know is our stadium has never been that full before and how long would it take and how orderly would it take to get everybody where they were. So even with all the pre-training and people were connected, uh, we, we made that decision. And the answer is it takes 15 minutes to drain probably over 4,000 people out of that stadium. 
It takes a longer time if you're in the middle of the stands. And in the bond, we have stands that'll have a center drain out. So on both ends and a center drain out, which will allow that to go much faster. Uh, different people were instructed to take people through different gates. And I'm so proud of our two communities because overall people were very orderly and they were, um, at first, I'm sure a lot of people are, you gotta be kidding me, we're gonna do this. It was such an electric environment and that was the last thing people wanted. But they, they went along with the flow and by the time they got in their cars, they said, boy, I'm glad I'm in the car. And so sometimes those decisions, I make enough weather decisions that I know that sometimes it's the right call, sometimes why did you make that call? And what the real thing was is we knew we had a lot of people in there that we had to make sure they got to their cars or in the school safe. From that evening, we had Orono students and West Tonka students, because as you can imagine, at a football game, kids go with kids. And when you have that many people close to a cell tower, you overwhelm the cell tower so people don't have connection. And we understood that this could be a, a scary thing for some students, some families, of how they're gonna reunite. And so kids are in the school. We have um, uh, our staff and our supervisors did a wonderful thing of just supervising. And what we tried to do is get the game in that day. But you have to wait a half an hour after the last lightning strike if the lightning is within a certain proximity. And we watched it and we said, we're gonna make a call at nine o'clock. And then it looked like that front was gonna go by us and that we could get this in yet. So we said 9.15. And after doing that three times at 9.45, we said, this is gonna go in and would've. I mean, it was still lightning probably well into past 11. And so we moved the game, obviously, to Saturday at one o'clock. And um, just so, so proud of just all the individual stories that you heard from so many people that tried to help people, of bringing people in their cars, trying to help them connect with parents. And it was the community that we know that we belong to, but it's just another example of it. Uh, Saturday, uh, we didn't have to worry about weather except that it was hot. I would say it was like an August scrimmage versus an October football game. And we were able to complete the game and we still had a nice crowd. It was too bad we couldn't finish it because the crowd was so electric that night, which was so incredibly fun. One thing when people are coming into our stadium, there's a couple things that we heard. One is that we do homecoming really well. A lot of people were really impressed with what's set up for kids. How. Uh, the boosters group said we we were grilling it. We did over 500 not we did 500 hot dogs uh, The concession stands in the quarter and a half almost got I mean it was just about depleted I mean there's only uh, so much and so we went through a lot of stuff Very quick, but people were very very impressed with the environment And I think people were really impressed with how we were able to evacuate the area Now obviously getting out of the parking lot took a really long time and so we know, we know that. But one thing that this does provide us is the opportunity to work with Minnetrista Police and our staff about constant training. And I would just share with the board that we take this exercise and we review and we try to plan for different events. And what this gives us is a little bit of a gauge of evacuating a mass group of people, how that works and what are some of the challenges. On the challenge of cell phone towers, one thing that is interested in is Orno, Minnetrista, Mount Fire, and the West Tonka School District all have a connection to what's called FirstNet. And FirstNet allows you to go to the top of the list of the cell tower if it's a case of emergency for first response responders and like school districts. And so one thing that we're looking at is bringing this on so our staff is connected on these kind of cellular walkies that we can use, which it can cover range in classrooms, but you can imagine in the time of emergency, anybody that was trying to make phone calls in there, you got through and then you were dropped, maybe you completed it, maybe you never could get through. But those are certain experiences that you can feel a little bit of the rhythm of what an emergency would feel like. So. Just wanted to share with the board, uh, homecoming was incredibly special on so many accounts. Uh, this one provided us a game that became uh, 
a learning opportunity for us. We're pleased when I talked to the police, there was not an accident involving the cars as they were leaving. Mm -hmm. And we did not get a report from a parent that um, just a lot of positive reports. And so there obviously are always a few things, so I'm not going to say that everything is was perfect, but it was really, really good. And I, I want to thank, there's too many to thank to call them out by name, but there's a lot of people involved in this. Uh, you look at the student senate of what those students do to put on a homecoming week, and it's really impressive. Their advisors, the admin, the staff members, just a lot of people gave a lot of themselves to make it a special week, and I think it was. Uh, you have three action items. One is to accept the audit, one is to approve the election judges, and then lastly to improve our contract with our teachers. The audit you saw presented here today, compliment again to Kathy, Pat, and team. That's an incredibly, that's a wonderful audit. Probably one of the best I've seen in my 18 years as a superintendent, and I, I thank you. Um, I also would say with the election judges, we follow the statute of how they're selected, which means they were involved in a general election with the city election the year before. These are people that we reach out to and they volunteered to be part of it. And so we work on those that have served in the past election and they, we send out a message to them and they accept that. And then our contract with our teachers, uh, we, we feel good that we are able to come to an agreement that recognizes uh, the competitiveness right now for staffing and that we try to stay competitive in our area. And by that we mean we have some school districts to the west and school districts to the east and we know that families that establish themselves here have a lot of different options. We want to be a competitive option where we know that there's districts to our east that are going to probably have a higher pay scale but that we want to be in a range that's competitive, that they would say, we like it at West Tonka and we feel like we have a competitive contract. And so what we did in this contract is try to ensure that we fell in between some of the West and the East here, and then we put 2.5% per year. We looked at sick leave and we fell below what a lot of the districts in the area offered for sick leave, so we made an adjustment to that. Uh, we made a little bit of an adjustment to bereavement leave, and those are some of the notable changes. In the end, um, we feel like this contract negotiation, first of all, it was approved by the teachers here today, and so we bring it to the board. But this doesn't put you at the top of that group, but it also keeps us in a place where I think we've been able to manage in the past, and I think our staff are appreciative. So I uh, want to thank um, Ralph and Gary for being part of those teacher negotiations. It was, a, it was a constructive process. Any questions on things that I shared or other? Just at, at discussion item B, we do a roll call vote, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. The comment, I was so um, surprised. I thought our middle school students were louder at the football game than our high school. <laughs> and maybe I was sitting there, but I'm like, is that you know I'm used to like little kids and it was this whole huge they're starting their own chance I'm like okay this is awesome I haven't seen that before so cool uh, the energy level was crazy yeah. I, I think my daughter would have taken exception at that statement but, that, but that's what we that's what we want but one yeah. thing one yeah. thing to your credit on Saturday when we had the kids here all of a sudden we had the cheerleaders and we had the homecoming core we had cheerleaders out there these different layers, and it was a time where we needed energy, and sure enough, they combined the middle school and the high school, and it was the back row, not the front row, that said, let's go wide hawk, and this eighth grader, or I'm guessing eighth, ninth grader, started the whole crew up, so I did witness something. So fun. What did I read in the paper? I think 18 games in the metro area were postponed that night. Oh, yes. yeah. That was, that was wow. Thursday, a couple for and Monday, so it wasn't, yeah. It was, and you look at, I mean, part of it is just saying, okay, teams were going to be there, but officials and all the different people that work an event, uh, your chain crew, I mean, these aren't just interchangeable parts you need to have. So officials are hard to find for anything right now. 
a strange weekend. And then you got a Sunday, you got the Twin City Marathon canceled for, yes, the for heat. heat. <laughs> and the hot dogs, we probably could have gone at least 50 to 100 more. I mean, it was sad. I had to go out and go, sorry, from here on back, we're done. And that, that crew was, was awesome impressive, too. by the way. They, they served really fast. Yeah, it was great. Really fast. Super fun. Well, Gary, you were involved in that? And, and well, Heidi and I were. You all used yeah, it. Yeah, Heidi and I were. Yeah, very fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's great. Yeah. All right, chair moves for approval of the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Move on to discussion items here. Discussion item. Uh, a, this here moves for approval of action item 9A, approval of the fiscal year 2023 audit report. Is there a second? Second. Right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Chair moves for approval of action item 9B, approval of the election judges for the November 7th, 2023 general and uh, special election. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so I just need to know that uh, you're voting in favor or against this uh, motion for election judges. Uh, Kelly Bowlby? Aye. Uh, Brian Carlson? Aye. Lauren Davis is an aye. Ralph Harrison is absent. Heidi Marty? Aye. Brian Roth? Aye. And Gary Wilmer? Aye. So the motion carries uh, six to zero with one person absent. Thank you, Lauren. Emily, is there anything that was stated or something you'd want added uh, on this? No, no, we're perfect. Okay. Will there be something for me to sign on that then? No. no? Or no, it'll be in the minutes? Yes. Okay. Chairman Wilner for 9C, I need to abstain for that one. Okay. Um, chair moves for approval of action 9C, approval of 2023 contract between uh, Westonka Education, Minnesota and the School Board of Independent School District 277. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And Ryan right. abstains. Ryan right. abstains and, and Ralph is absent. So awesome. Anybody else have anything else to come before the board here? I thought it was really fun to see the robotics. Oh, that was, that's uh, so cool. I was serious, I think they should do, the community should do one for adults. <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd, yeah, that'd be, well, no, you got some people. time on your hands. I got some time on my hands, yeah. <laughs> my granddaughter was talking about um, the little Lego thing that yeah. you were talking about. I, I, I sit there and I couldn't figure out what she was talking about. Now, yeah. now it all yeah. makes sense. I was telling the, the students who were here, I was telling them, you know, my youngest graduated, Aaron graduated in 2010. And Aaron would get in trouble in junior high school or middle school because the teacher would be teaching and he'd be like taking a pen apart to see what, how it was working. But then, you know, she'd ask a question and he'd answer. But he was always wanting to do stuff with his hands. And he just, you know, he was about, you know, about 10 years too too early for all of the, the robotics and the engineering courses and things. I'm so excited for this generation that we keep building Absolutely. and adding in that area because I think that's just, that's so exciting, I think. And well, I'm looking at the, the witness down at the convention yeah. center, the robotics thing. Yeah. Just, okay. well, he said, hey, you want to take the remote control? And I said, no, I'll just bust it. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking, looking at the new bond and, and wanting to add, you know, Nursery, courses in yeah, some of those spread. areas yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I mean, that to me is just so exciting yeah. that yeah. we keep moving forward in those areas. Okay. Well, I'll move for adjournment. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 